Okay, I think we ought to, ought to go ahead and try to get started here with the next uh, panel session. So welcome back, everybody, and uh, thanks, Tom, for leading a, a great session the last time. Um, we'll have uh, the topic for this one is about how science communication, how does that affect the public's perception of science? Who are we? What are we doing? What's it like out there? And so I've got a, a series of questions, and I think the panel has had an opportunity maybe to, to think about some of these things, and we'll see if we can put some new twist on it. But I'd like to, uh, to start out and ask Eric if he can lead off and then answer this question for me, if you will. So in your experience, what attributes of uh, science communication resonate I guess most strongly with your audiences, and then also conversely, what attributes uh, are probably going to fall flat? So I should probably um, give the caveat that uh, when when we're talking about public perception of science, that I um, probably can speak with most authority on that slice of the public that is the policymaking world, um, congressional staff, members of Congress. Um, which is, of course, a, a small slice, but a very important slice, since these are the folks who advise the people who set the funding levels and set the policies and so forth. Um, I, a couple things uh, strike me. W one is, uh, and also I would say that the communicators that we're talking that I dealt with most often would be. NIH, and also organizations like FASIB and researchers from universities and so forth. And when they would do the communicating, they had specific goals. And those goals were more money or maintaining the money or uh, new policies or defending policies, that kind of thing. So that's kind of – that's the communication that they were um, uh, uh, most interested in. The, uh, I would say that when those communications happened, when NIH came, when researchers came, uh, they started in a really good place. I mean, there was, I would say the most congressional staffers, members of Congress, they trust the information. They're not going to think it's fake news if NIH or, or a researcher comes. They're, they are there with a, uh, in a position of authority. They're going to be believed. They're uh, starting in a good place. We can't take that for granted, of course, and that ebbs and flows over time. But right now, in Congress, it's a, a, a bipartisan, tremendous support for NIH. I would say that we can't necessarily that's, assume that's the case for basic research. And that's one of the things that I think is maybe we're talking about is so far we haven't distinguished as much uh, between overall uh, scientific research and basic research. <coughs> It seems kind of counterintuitive, but on the Hill sometimes uh, basic research can be viewed as a luxury. The, the idea, you know, well, money's tight. People have cancer now. People have Alzheimer's now. We should really be spending the money on the uh, stuff that's immediately going to lead to a cure or, or, or some development. And there, the, uh, the idea that well, should we be spending as much on things that might lead to something 30 years from now? Yeah, it doesn't really make sense, but that, that's the way it can, it can be viewed as uh, a lower priority. So I would say that, um, you know, things that would work for, uh, for my you know, former self as a, a former staffer when, when hearing about um, basic research – would uh, one would be um, part of it is the is the message uh, sorry how the message is conveyed is indeed some of the message itself it's like when Eric was Erica was talking about you know, conveying the excitement that's uh, often you know, sometimes scientists researchers would come in and meet with me and they they would sort of make their case for uh, more funding, but they actually wouldn't even tell me what they were working on. Uh, they would sort of deliver the talking points, but they wouldn't actually 
And I would want to know, well, what, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you excited about? And hearing the, the person's excitement about uh, whatever it was they were working on was often the thing I really remembered, to be honest. It was that, oh my gosh, this, you know, this person is excited. That means you know, I f would feel good about recommending to my boss we should put more money into such and such because I know there are these, these people out there that are really going to want to use this money well. Um, and the other thing that I think would, that I like to hear was the stories about how basic research 30 years ago led to the break breakthroughs of today. And that is not a, a, something that is going to be obvious to a lot of staffers or members. Remember that uh, a, practically everyone that you all would interact with on the Hill is a layman. And there are you know, ranges in that, but they're not necessarily going to understand the path uh, backward from a uh, great development today. What had to happen 30 years ago in terms of basic research to be able to make that happen? So I'll, I'll stop there. I, I, I don't want, uh, there's more to say, but uh, let me stop there. Okay, thanks. Matt? So I guess the way that I'll rephrase or recouch the question is, is how, does the, how does the way that we talk about science affect the way that people hear it, right? So with the exception of um, people who have firsthand personal experiences in a lab or, you know, they, they're married to a scientist or they are a scientist or their cousin's a scientist or whatever, people know what you tell them. Right? So it's really that simple, um, and you, we, we shouldn't even need to say it, but we obviously need to say it. And so there are some fundamental elements of a story that you need to convey when you are telling people about science or about anything else that you want them to engage with meaningfully. Right? So first of all, uh, if you want them to pay attention to you, you need to articulate for them why they should care. I mean, that's that's the threshold issue. Um, if they if you can't get them to read past the first sentence or if you get them to listen to you beyond the first sentence, you've already lost the end game over. So th that can there are multiple ways to do that. But, you know, one is that uh, you can find some sort of uh, practical tie in that's relevant to them. You've built a better mousetrap or whatever, which rarely is the case in the context of um, basic science. Um, but the other thing is that you can talk about well, why are you, you being the researcher, why are you doing this, right? We, it's become up again and again about the, the idea of passion, and, and that's good. Passion is good. People are attracted to and engaged by um, emotional, you know, when people are like, yes, instead of, you know, automaton-like, yes, right? <laughs> so um, that the passion is great, but intellectually, Something made you want to ask this question in the first place. Why? Why are you passionate about it? Right. So if you can begin to tease that out, then you, you might have a you know an opportunity to um, you know begin to make people interested. Um, and there are a bunch of other storytelling techniques which I will not go into now. But some of the other things that we definitely need to to include when we're having this conversation with people, when we are sharing information with people, is context. Again, this has come up in different ways through the conversations this morning. But whether we're talking about how this fits into the continuum of research, um, what came before it, what questions it raises moving forward in terms of future directions, but context is absolutely critical. Um, the limitations of the research, we need to make that clear as well. That's why we don't want to see uh, news releases or news stories or news items of any kind, you know, saying that we've cured cancer when we have not, in fact, cured cancer. I'm still waiting for my flying car while we're at it. Um, and also, and uh, this is works with context, but um, it's really important to talk about next steps, I think. Um, it's not going to work in every case, but if you're trying to engage people in basic research, 
it's one of the things that I find especially engaging about basic research is every time you answer a question, you get like 57 additional questions, maybe more, right? So what are some of those new questions, new possibilities, new directions that come about as a result of a finding that are especially exciting or interesting and why? That's it, I'm done. <laughs> okay, thanks. So personal passion limitations and give it some thought and see where it goes. Well, that's our experiment for today. So Joe, you wanna take up on part of the question, see where we go? Okay, we've got some, some big questions here and some smaller smaller questions. I'm uh, not sure which of the two to attack first, but let me start at the, at the larger end of things. Um, uh, the panel has been um, charged with talking about the public's perception of science broadly, both in terms of what it is as a result of science communication and then um, sort of implicitly in the same question is how this comes about. And so those are uh, at least visible kinds of kinds of questions. I think we all know uh, about some of the kinds of consequences that have uh, come about in public perceptions of science with uh, the sense that people have become increasingly um, skeptical about scientific claims. They've been increasingly frustrated by uh, the uh, change in uh, um, claims that are made about particular uh, questions that are pertinent to their, their lives. So there's a frustration element. There's a mistrust of scientists because they are seen as being uh, self-interested and so on. And on a topic near and dear to my heart, there's a kind of cynicism that has developed uh, about, about the scientific uh, process in a variety of domains, even though people still do trust scientists in many ways in contrast to everybody else that they don't trust, um, <clears throat> starting with uh, Congress and, and, and others. Um, but uh, in, in, a, in effect, we have a lot of, of consequential uh, effects on public uh, perception about the scientific process that we're all well aware of. One of the, the other part of this question is, you know, how, how has this come about? Uh, and not in the grand sense of uh, historical uh, developments, although I think that's an interesting and important question, but rather in terms of the kinds of, of research that uh, has a basis for uh, explaining some of the frustration and cynicism about science. And in some of the research that uh, I'm familiar with, what's pretty clear is that the way in which uh, uh, people have become aware of uh, changing facts, changing fact bases as claims that are again pertinent to their lives uh, have changed whether those claims are about you know when uh, and how much mammography screening there should be and whether or not uh, you know uh, prostate cancer screening ought to uh, move forward, whether e-cigarettes uh, are something that we should promote or we should uh, stand in the way of. Um, in, a, in a sense the, the crucial uh, set of questions here is about this kind of changing uh, scientific uh, set of claims that uh, the public has to deal with. Again, not so much in a general sense, but rather in a particular sense of, of you know, relevant scientific claims that affect their lives on a, on a daily basis. And this, this question of relevance and pertinence and, and, and consequentiality to individual lives has come up in actually several presentations already today when we've talked about presenting scientific information um, and uh, presenting the process of science and so on. But um, we've already just heard the, uh, right now the, the importance of making all of those kinds of claims relevant. Once they are, then the question is, what are people hearing about science from, uh, from scientists as translated through press releases and through, uh, and through the, news, the news media? Um, one last observation here that uh, I, I would want to make is that uh, one of the questions that has interested us uh, recently and that we're doing some work on has to do not just with scientific uncertainty and the uh, change over time in the kind of factual claims that are made, but with uh, core scientific disagreements where uh, prestigious, highly credible scientific groups are coming out on the opposite sides of, uh, of, uh, of key issues. Um, the, the topic that uh, we're giving our attention to right now is e-cigarettes, and we've had public um, and very uh, strong statements being made by various uh, scientific groups um, taking up exactly the opposite <coughs> claims about this issue. And this kind of core scientific disagreement is um, uh, the nature of science and so on. But now as communicators, to me, the question that's of interest is what, should, what is our responsibility in the face of 
core scientific disagreement, not just uncertainty and um, you know, uh, lack of consensus and so on, but core disagreement. And should we and do we have a responsibility to, one, ignore the issue or to speak to the issue if we're going to speak to the issue as, uh, as entities uh, uh, with the policy cons considerations, how should we speak to that, to that issue? We don't have a good answer to that, but we are going to be examining some of those, those questions. Okay, thanks. Kurt, why, what, uh, what resonates? What falls flat? So, so I'm a little different than everybody else up here. I'm a marketing guy. So how, so do, we, how do we sell this, right? Yeah. Um, and is hype really all that bad? I think that's a, that's a question we have to ask. Um, if you think about it, I mean, we have to differ, We have to define what hype is very specifically because, you know, there's one way of looking at it where it's, you know, this dishonest, you know, just overblowing something and and not being authentic. And then there's this other understanding of it that it's the interesting and exciting stuff and making something, uh, creating a story, um, developing a narrative that is true to the science but also interesting. So by saying we've got to avoid hype, a lot of people are probably hearing that as we've just got to stick to the facts. We've got to stick to the script. We've got to play it straight. And, and I'll tell you, that is a losing battle because the loudest, we're, we're, we're in a society right now where the loudest voice wins. Um, you know, that's who gets the attention. So if we think about, you know, the, the M word is such a dirty word in, in this community, marketing. And how do we sell science? What is our ultimate goal? Uh, and I can talk a little bit about when I was at Georgia Tech. You know, my role the last few years there was singular. The goal was very specific. Generate more industry research dollars, period. So how do we do that? We've got a thousand different areas of research that we work in. Well, anybody who knows anything about marketing knows you can't market a thousand things. So. You take that and you boil it down to 12 core research areas. And we say, okay, we've got critical mass in these areas. Um, these areas actually map nicely to industry sectors. So, so how do we make those connections? How do we tell those stories in a way that will resonate with the people in those sectors so that they will then pick up the phone and call us and say, we've got a problem, we'd like you to help us. So, so we worked very hard on that, but the first step was defining what the goal is and being laser-like focused on that goal. Um, you know, one of the issues that we're all dealing with is, you know, we've got these loud anti-science voices out there that are very good at marketing, and they're very good at hype, and they're very good at messaging. If we don't become as good and as aggressive as they are, then we're going to lose every single time because their message is a message that is about emotion. It's all emotion. It's belief. It's ideology. It's emotion. People connect with that. If we stick to the facts, only a small part of the community is going to get that every single time, and we're going to miss out on everybody else. So, you know, bring, bring can, in Can that. you clarify something real quick, Kirk? Because sure. I just want to make sure everybody in the audience is, is understanding something properly. So w what do you mean by just stick to the facts? You're not, you're not asking us to make stuff up, right? Oh, no, no, not at all. Right, okay. Well, so no. just, just I, wanted, thought we would I, want no, to clarify that. No, I'm not that. saying that. What I'm saying is if, you, if, if we just play it so straight that we don't you know, um, you know, develop a creative narrative, make it interesting, um, then we're, then, then we're going to come out on the short end of the stick. We're not going to win this battle. Um, and you know, every, the, other, the other thing that just occurred, occurred to me you know, when the first panel was talking, you know, they were talking about belief systems and the fact that there are folks out there who see science as a belief system. Well, part of it is because we're always playing defense. We're always on the defense, defending our funding, defending our reputation, correcting misinformation. How often are we on the offense? I don't know what the answer is for that, uh, you know, about how we do it, but I can certainly tell you we're not on the offense that often. And what we're doing is we are using our knowledge, our facts, our expertise to battle a belief system and an ideology, which in the minds of many people in the public would have them thinking that we are an ideology and a belief system also. So we're perpetuating that. 
Um, so, so what I say, marketing is not a dirty word. Let's think about how we can leverage it for our own benefit. Okay, well, that's an interesting perspective. And I, and I, and I think you, you, make, you make really good points there. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ivan, you want to follow up on this? Um, I actually do want to follow up on that, but I need to think about it a little bit, Kurt. Um, what I wanted to share with you in terms of this sort of public perception of science is, is driven by um, my experience thinking about, to be honest, the sort of worst side of science, which is, uh, of course, where I spend most of my time um, with Retraction Watch. Um, you know, one of the things that we have seen time and time again is that um, the science and I'm going to, again, oversimplify, overgeneralize here, but uh, when it comes to whether it's marketing, whether it's PR, whether it's just messages and communication, uh, generally sort of would like everyone to believe that uh, we're living in Lake Wobegon, right? So all of the, what is it, what is the phrase, all of the children are above average, the, what is it, men are strong, women are good looking, and all the, women, the children are above average or something like that, okay? Um, everything is above average, right? There is nothing wrong. Um, please stop bothering us with all these pesky questions about why, uh-oh, studies don't seem to reproduce and we don't seem to know why. And, oh, well, oh, there's, there's some people who are apparently committing fraud in science. And, wow, that's, that's kind of shocking. And so, again, I, I, I'm going to sound like a broken record with the shocked, shocked, uh, you know, scene. But if you continually, whether it's market, whether communicate, whatever the word you want to use is, the idea that science is entirely self-correcting, uh, that scientific publishing is entirely self-correcting, which let me just stop you there, um, you are going to have a problem when it turns out that it isn't. Now, I fully agree with what Kirk's saying about the notion of fighting this battle and, and all of that, but if, if let me give you some, some data here that are not directly about how the public perceives science, because I, I, I defer to other experts on that, but I can tell you how scientists and researchers tend to, and again, I'll tell you what the data are in a second, tend to view people who actually either commit fraud or come forward about something that was an honest error, or even come, come clean about something that was fraud in their own lab. So, and these are, these are studies that three different groups have found the same thing. So you could say it came out once and then it's been replicated twice, okay? The, what you find when people retract papers for fraud, and it's very clear that they're, they're being retracted for fraud, what you find is that people stop citing them, okay? So you see a decline in citations to the, that person's work, not just that paper, obviously, but to their entire work, on average about 10 to 15 percent. In fact, you see the entire subspecialty, that whole field, see a decline in citations of 10 to 15 percent. So if you ever want to really, you know, just screw things up for everybody who you know, commit fraud and, and you know, sort of not complain about it because chances are you weren't. When, however, a paper is retracted and it's clear that it was due to honest error and the retraction notice says that it's due to honest error and it, and it makes a compelling story, there's a real compelling narrative there. In fact, you don't see any decline in citations. One of the three papers I mentioned actually suggests you might see an increase. To be honest, those data, you know, hasn't been replicated, so let's not sort of treat that as repl replicated. But you don't see a decline. And given the way that science works, to get back to what I was saying earlier this morning about incentives, and the fact that, therefore, citations are one of the very important coins of the realm, it's, again, I'm, I don't want to overgeneralize here and say that, therefore, public perception is driven by that. But it's hard to sort of not draw at least some parallels and some understandings of the fact that, again, overgeneralizing here, oversimplifying, people actually appreciate honesty and transparency. Now, it may not be everyone. It may be that the loudest people win and all of that. And um, I'd like to hear more about, about all those issues. But at the end of the day, if science really wants to ha play a long-term game, okay, as opposed to a short-term game, because to me, if your goal is always to just make sure you continue to get the same level of funding or get more funding, um, that's, that's a short-term strategy. If you actually want to maintain and build and, and even grow the trust uh, of the public, uh, you've got to start with your own colleagues first, which is what those data, I, I think those data that I shared were uh, speak to. Um, and you, you really need to sort of think about the fact that if you keep coming out and saying that 
uh, all is well in Lake Wobegon, and all, in fact, is better than average in Lake Wobegon, and it turns out that things aren't so good in Lake Wobegon. And again, we're only talking about a vanishingly small percentage of people. But it is remarkable. There's this sort of number that I, I, I don't, again, want to overstate the evidence, but every time we talk to people who, you know, more or less do what we do in, in other fields, whether it's police misconduct, whether it's financial misconduct, there's a sort of magical 2% that keeps coming up. And again, definitions change. I don't want to overstate the case. But if we're talking about a 2% sort of percentage, a 2% rate of people in any sort of human endeavor committing misconduct, why not be upfront about that, saying here's what science, unlike every other field, quite frankly, is doing about it. We're trying to correct the record and what have you. Um, I think that's a much better long-term strategy for public trust. Thank you. Anthony, you want to bring up the end here on this question? Surely, thanks. Um, let me remind real quick, one thing I didn't get to do earlier today was elaborate on who I am and what I do. Um, so I'm a communication professor at University of Texas, and um, I basically study the science of science communication, what's now called the science of science communication, uh, particularly focused on um, scientist public engagement activities, and also to some extent focused on this issue of public understanding of science as well. Um, lots of interesting things brought up so far by my fellow panelists. I have a lot of things I'd love to comment on and respond to, but I'll just point out a couple quick things that I hope may be of value to the, the broader audience here, is that the question that we have for this particular section is enormous, right? It's a really huge question to unpack, one which I would argue we're not going to solve in an hour. So I would kindly point the folks in this room and the folks watching to this huge body of academic literature that is focused solely on dealing with this particular question. There are journals that deal with this. Um, some of you are probably familiar with the National Science Board Science and Engineering Indicators Report that comes out every other year. Chapter seven of that report summarizes um, at an aggregate level what is currently known via survey research about public attitudes towards science, public interest in science, um, the, the types of media that people are using to interact with and share information about science, et cetera. So I would just, I think that's an important kind of clarifying comment for this particular question is that it's a really big question and it represents lots of different areas of very vigorous um, research. And it also is really hard to answer as a result of that. Um, beyond that, I think, you know, you mentioned what resonates. I think one thing that's also important to, and, and a number of my panelists have, have commented on that. Um, if I could real quick just comment on one thing that that doesn't resonate um, as kind of a counterpoint to that. And I think a lot of the conversations I've had with folks in the room um, certainly indicate that we're aware of this, but I think it's important to kind of say it explicitly. What doesn't resonate is straight information dumps. Okay, and that, many of you in the room have probably heard of the deficit model, the knowledge <laughs> deficit model. Um, in order to improve appreciation of science, we open up said individual's head, we dump in accurate information, we close said individual's head, and they go on and they, they have great science literacy, they believe in science, they want it funded, et cetera. Guess what? Surprise, that does not work, right? That does not work. Um, decades and decades of research in the social sciences suggest that that's just not how people process. Um, and so that brings us back to um, a number of comments that folks uh, have made on the panel already about, well, then, you know, what does resonate? And I think um, using various terms and, and making various comments, we one thing that we kind of talk about is that, you know, we have to go to where the people are, even echoing something that Angela was talking about earlier, this notion of really, we really need to understand our audience when we're thinking about communication, um, knowing very well that most people aren't inherently predisposed, when we're talking about public, um, public situation here. Most people aren't inherently predisposed to care about and think deeply about science. I don't mean to sound cynical saying that, but um, a lot of people would make that point. And so in order to engage them meaningfully, to have meaningful information exchange, uh, the nature of the communication has to essentially go where they are, has to be aware of these mental filters that they use to make sense of the world, the worldviews they have, the extent of the religiosity, their political ideology, all these wonderful concepts that we kick around in social science all the time, to find a way to connect with them, a common ground to connect with them so that a meaningful communication can occur. Um, it's not a thing that's easy to do. Um, there is no one-size-fits-all way of doing that. It is, I would argue, it's sophisticated and difficult. Um, but being aware um, that, that, again, people aren't predisposed to, to scientific information and that you need to go where they are 
I think is a key part of the um, of the formula here as we talk about this. Well, thanks. I, you know, I, th I think you bring up a, a really good point in the uh, National Academy report that was released in, uh, I think it was in December, that talked about this. And even though that Academy report was focused on, here are the research questions that people who study science communications need to look at, one of the points in the report was actually, and scientists need to be more engaged in these kinds of processes to be able to carry that forward. And that's one of the questions I'd like to, to bring up now. How much, what do you think the individual scientist can do to help this communication, to help it get better? I mean, we've talked about passion. We've talked about stories. We've talked about those sorts of things. But I'd like to get more detailed into that because going forward, my hope would be that individual scientists can come away from this empowered with some specifics. So, uh, Matt, you want to pick up on that? Sure. Sure. Um, I think, well, first of all, very few people get into uh, biological research so that they can talk to the press um, or their <laughs> P PR guy. Uh, and I'm being the person that hounds them to do so, I'm well aware of that. Uh, but one of the things that both reporters and public information officers like myself, what we really need from the research community um, is a very um, valuable resource, and that is their time. Um, you know, people have labs to run if they're in higher ed. They have graduate students to supervise and courses to teach or to get their graduate students to teach. Uh, and then I've even heard of scientists who have lives outside of the lab, loved ones and children and hobbies um, that they would like to devote some time to. So I'm well aware that it is a finite pie that we are asking for a slice of, but we need time because we need the researchers' time to articulate to us um, what they're doing, why they're doing it. Um, we need their time uh, so that they give us a heads up early enough so that we have time to, to figure out how we can work with them to, to tell this story. Um, and then if we're successful, there will be reporters who call it, will want even more of their time so that they can talk about it. Um, and it does take time to do this effectively because um, even, you know, a reporter who has a background in biology does not necessarily have a background in that specific realm of biology. And so there's going to be, um, you know, s some explanation that needs to, to take place. And they're going to have a zillion questions because that's what good reporters do. Um, so th I think at the most fundamental level, that is what we are asking researchers for, and we are aware of its value. Um, but we really need it if we want to do this well. Okay, thanks. Um, Joe? I'm going to say something strange here, and, and that is that I think uh, given everything that we've been talking about in terms of the incentives that operate to um, maintain interest and excitement about a particular set of findings, um, I think one of the things that we need to be sure that we communicate to all of the scientists who are involved in getting some attention for their research is a willingness to present their findings in a way that is, is sufficiently subtle, sufficiently context-specific, and uh, sufficiently narrow and fallible as to admit the possibility that there isn't a lot of interest in this work uh, at the moment until we have robust conclusions. In other words, not every finding out of every lab is worth a lot of attention, and therefore to be sensitive to avoiding hyping findings that you would rather have a replication of in your lab or someone else's lab before taking that uh, that finding forward. Um, and this, this, the only reason I'm raising this is because I think um, 
one of the points that was made uh, this morning by Ivan that I thought was very, very important was the notion that there is an incentive structure throughout the um, science communication system, industry if you want to use that, that phrase, that um, it is directed toward getting more attention, getting one's work uh, 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 seen in the, in the media, in front of the public and so on. And, and maybe we need to back off that a bit. And we can, as individual scientists, say, I've got a really interesting finding here, but I'm not going to take it forward until I have a replication. And this does get to the robustness and fallibility of scientific findings, but maybe some of the incentive structure needs to be uh, inculcated by scientists. We pushed in a different direction. Let's make ourselves uh, um, of, of interest to the public. Let's let's push uh, to enhance our, our public uh, uh, position. And maybe we need to do something a little less strong in that arena as individuals, and that would help reduce some of the incentives to move prematurely into a domain that um, is maybe important, maybe exciting, um, maybe of great interest, but let's be sure we got the story right and, and do it again, uh, conceptually or otherwise. Thanks, Sunil. Now, now we had heard from Kirk that you got to go out there, you got to push it if you're going to get anywhere. And now we've just heard from Joseph. Yeah, yeah, take a little yeah. bit easy, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, how, so no, how, many, how many people in the room have done a study that they went out and tried to replicate and it didn't replicate? Okay. I did, you know. And so, you know, now we, and we got some publicity for that study. I wish that we had waited on the replication. Kirk, take it. <laughs> so I don't disagree. Um, I think it's balance. That's really the key. Um, so, you know, one of the things that, that I was really fortunate to have um, at Georgia Tech was a great uh, team of research writers, science writers that I worked with. Um, and one of the questions that we always asked when we got uh, tipped off about something great that was going to be published or something, you know, a new finding uh, from one of the labs was, is there enough meat on the bone? Is there something that is worth talking about here? Um, and that was that was really a, that was a barometer for us. Um, we didn't want to be caught out there in the cold, and we certainly didn't want to have any of the researchers out there, um, you know, thinking, "Gosh, you know, now I'm now I, I have just walked the plank. Now I have to jump in the water." Um, so, so it was, it, it was really important. It, I mean, if you think about you know what scientists can do, well, we, we need them to work with us, and all it takes is one story like that, and you develop a reputation within your own university that people don't want to work with you. So, so we took that very seriously. Um, so there's balance between making a story that's making a story or uh, about about a research effort that's interesting and easy to understand, but you also have the pressure of well, if you make it too easy to understand, I'm going to look silly, you know, with my peers. So, um, so trying to make sure that you have that perfect balance, which is very, very difficult, but skilled writers are able to do that, skilled science communication people. We, and we had a group of people who were doing that. Now, now when we talk about the, you know, the, the pressures, you know, nobody's going to get tenure because they went and did a, an interview on NBC News you know, or got on the front page of the New York Times. It's just not going to happen. Um, it's not something that's valued. I mean, some universities might put a little tick mark in the column for it, but a lot of universities don't. Um, so, so I always tried to make the connection, especially to those non-tenured professors. Well, you know, citations are important. Attention is important. You want to make more presentations. You want collaborations. Uh, you want to become more well-known. Well, there are the formal ways that you have to do that. The old, I, I call them the old-fashioned ways, but they're the traditional ways. Um, and then there are other ways. You know, you can shine a light on your work. You can work with the communications team. You can get on social media. You can start a blog. There's, you know, the possibilities are becoming endless. Um, so, so when they see that connection, um, and uh, you know, you can you can generate some traction there. The other thing is, you know, there are a lot of folks who are hesitant to engage in, in any way in the first place. Um, number one, you don't force anybody to do something they're not ready to do or they don't want to do. If they're not willing to engage, they're not going to be good at it. They are not going to be passionate about it. And, and you're better off working with the folks who do want to do it. 
So when I was at the Georgia Tech Research Institute, I developed a coalition of the willing, a group of people who were interested in doing something a little bit broader, stepping out of the box a little bit, being a little less conservative with what they, you know, what they were doing, and we promoted their work locally, nationally, and we were able a few months out to look at what the results were of the exposure that they got. Did new grants come in the door and what was the total? Did they get invited to present at a conference that they wouldn't have gotten invited to otherwise? And we were able to use that information to convince other people who were on the fence about communicating to come on over and give it a try because they saw, oh, well, there is something that can come out of this. It's not just 100% risk. There actually could be a benefit. So that was very important. And finally, as communicators, we need to be able to say no. That goes right back to the meat on the bone. If somebody is coming to us saying, oh, I've got to get press on this, which isn't always the case, but every once in a while you get that overzealous professor who wants to get that attention, you have to look at it and say, you know, is there enough here? Are we going to embarrass ourselves? Could we wait? And if we wait, will it be a much better story because we'll actually have more of a result to talk about? And, you know, just taking your time could be a big benefit there. Okay. Eric, I see you sitting down there smiling. Sure. No, uh, <laughs> I, well, I was just laughing um, when uh, Kirk was talking about how some are suited for it and some are not. I remember one time when I was working in the Senate, there was a particular researcher. I was, I, I was so excited to meet this researcher because he, he is a giant and he hardly ever spoke to uh, Congress, practically never spoke to the media. And I got this me meeting with him, and then I understood why. And it was like, okay, well, he's right where he should be. He's staying in the lab, and that's good. Um, uh, on, on the other hand, you know, um, HUD asked, okay, what should uh, individual um, uh, researchers do? Um, it, and we've talked about this, you know, certainly in a public policy arena, speak out and come to Congress and – make their case. One, they have an obligation, honestly, in this environment, which uh, we're hearing anti-science messages, when vac vaccines, climate change, you name it. Scientists have an obligation to speak out now. And uh, the other reason I would say it surprised me, it probably would surprise you, it probably would surprise the researchers, how much public policy Bills that are written, laws that are made on the basis of one meeting or one person that a member of Congress knows. Uh, and who knows when that you know, meeting might have occurred. It might have occurred a week ago. It might have been somebody that the member remembers meeting 10 years ago. But so often it is that uh, hearing the personal story from a particular researcher that is going – is going to be what they remember more so, as as was said already, you know, than the dump of facts. Um, it, it is somebody, uh, yeah, th that encounter can make all the difference, and you just never know when that's going to happen. So I think the uh, scientist just being there, being able to tell the story, is uh, absolutely critical now, as critical as it's ever been. I remember in one in one meeting a former congressman uh, who is at a well-known uh, organization now in science said uh, about Congress people, when you go to Congress, tell them stories. They get stories. That's how they got elected. And I think that really resonates with what, what you're saying here. Uh, Ivan? Yeah, I guess I would just, um, again, sort of on this theme that I'm trying to cultivate of taking a long-term view, uh, I, I think everything I've heard makes sense and I would agree with, and, and particularly the, the telling stories bit. Uh, as a journalist, that's what I want. I actually want the data that go behind the stories too, but if there isn't a story there, it's going to be hard for me to hang much on it. Um, but I want to sort of turn this around a little bit and say that the goal in terms of relationships with the media, again, should be long-term. And so it, it can't always be about your own work. If it is, you're going to develop a reputation for one thing, but it's also just not that, you know, it's much less likely that you will be of interest to whomever it is you're trying to cultivate a relationship if you only stick to your own work 
than if you actually become useful to that person. You know, here we are, I guess not quite in Washington, but damn close. And like, you know, journalists and sources, and guess what, folks who are scientists, you end up being a source for journalists, and obviously I'm going to look for certain kinds of information, and other reporters are going to look for other kinds of information. Um, we trade information. Maybe I'm not supposed to, you know, acknowledge that on a live webcast, but I'm looking for information from you, and I'm not only looking for information from you about your own work. Uh, I'm looking for what might be interesting that is related to your work. Somebody else is doing. You can tell me good, bad, or otherwise. Frankly, I mean, in my line of work, bad is usually better. But, you know, if you're trying to sort of cultivate a source, be useful. So um, there's someone who actually isn't here in Washington. Who is here in Washington? Uh, Denise Graveline, who. Uh, uh, who's really worth following. She's don't get caught on Twitter. Denise really, you know, and I'm going to steal this line from her, but she has at least one blog post about it. Uh, pitch less, tip more. So tip about things that aren't related to you and, and be useful and be that outside source. I got news to you. There are about a do at least a dozen, maybe more than that, multiple time, uh, multiple opportunities to be the outside source and to be quoted and to get your name in lights if that's what you want. If you are looking at it from that point of view, then if you're only thinking about how do I get my work on the front page of New York Times, I actually find it much more useful to look at who's being quoted as an outside source on that front page New York Times story than I do the person who's just coming up with you know what's probably very interesting. Um, but really think about this as a long-term strategy. And, and again, to, to quote Denise, you know, pitch less, tip more. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess uh, it's your turn. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's really nice talking after everybody else because I can <laughs> yeah. try to assimilate their ideas. Um, I want to respond real quick to something Kirk brought up and a couple other folks uh, mentioned as well. It is, and I'm saying this selfishly, of course, I have a job in part because it's really exciting that we're at a point where the scientific community is taking and talking very seriously about communication and public engagement. That's great. However, as we get wrapped up and excited about this and move in bold, new, wonderfully effective directions, I would just want to echo what Kirk said. This does not mean that all scientists should communicate or engage, right? Um, speaking as someone who works in an advertising and PR department um, and thinks about these issues um, from a kind of a strategic communication level, that's strategic communication 101, right? Have good spokespeople. Um, and so, you know, um, I think that's an important thing to mention. Um, uh, the survey work that I do, I, most of my research is focused on surveying scientists from different disciplines about public engagement. Um, and one argument that we find that is kind of a, things that are, we're very interested in what factors predict a scientist's actual engagement behavior, right? So how, uh, what's associated with that? What associates their willingness to do it in the future? And we have a good sense of what some of those things are. And that, you know, transitioning that back to a practical aspect, uh, kind of a practical realm, basically suggests that when it comes to helping scientists with engagement, you go out, you find the scientists who enjoy it or think they'll enjoy it, and those who think they have capacity or want to get capacity. And you put your resources toward those particular scientists, right? It's a strategic approach. But again, if we're concerned about money, we're concerned about resources, um, it also makes sense. Um, okay, so beyond that, I'll go back to the original question uh, of this session. We talked about um, what can scientists do to help contribute to meaningful influence on public, on public perceptions of science. And I'm thinking, again, in terms of public engagement here, uh, real quickly want to point out we're talking about changing attitudes, which again, strategic communication professionals would say is further down the hierarchy of effects, right? We can change awareness. We can seek to change knowledge. We can seek to change knowledge or attitudes and behavior. Changing attitudes and behavior are easier or harder than changing awareness. Harder, right? Um, so that's important to recognize here that we're talking about doing something that's potentially uh, somewhat tricky, and I'm sure lots of companies would echo that reality. Um, in terms of what scientists can do, uh, going back, I'm again going to echo something Angela mentioned earlier in the first panel, um, and I can say this because I am a, a scientist, albeit a social scientist, show that you're human, show that you're human. Um, and what I mean by that, I think, is in terms of communication style, um, show that you are an active listener, that you're relatable, um, that you're transparent. Um, how many of you in the room are familiar with the Alda Center for Communicating Science? So a lot of you are familiar with that. Their main tenet, 
right, their unique selling proposition, if you will, is that before you can have meaningful information exchange about science or environmental issues, you have to establish relatability and rapport with whomever it is you're engaging with, right? And so that's, I would argue, a really important thing. By the way, I'm about to, within the next year, actually evaluate the Alda Center and help and work with them and figure out what's working and what's maybe, what could be done better relative to the wonderful work that they do. Another one that's near and dear to my heart is to have concrete goals or objectives for your communication or engagement efforts. The past couple of years, I don't want to go on a tangent talking too much about research. Long story short, a colleague of mine and I have been surveying scientists from a number of different fields, asking them questions about what kind of goals they have for engagement, what kind of objectives they have for engagement. We've surveyed more than 7,000 scientists from eight different huge professional science societies. Maybe some of you received our survey last year. And the results suggest, at this point, that scientists have a very narrow set of goals when it comes to engagement, which are focused on informing and educating and defending science from mistruths or correcting the record. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, but that's a narrow set of goals. Notice that what those goals didn't include were any of the things I mentioned associated with the Alda Center, like building or maintaining trust, conveying warmth, showing active listening, et cetera. And also the baseline question of do you have a goal when you go into your engagement? Most of the time, the data would suggest the answer is no. I've not thought through a clear goal. So I would argue that that's a really important thing for a scientist to do before he or she seeks to engage more. One last point, or two last points, I'll be quick, I promise. To evaluate, iterate, and get feedback. Again, that came up, I think, in panel one this morning. It's really important. Generally, we don't do a good job of that. In other words, if we're engaging, we're making these efforts to evaluate how they're going, to get feedback from our colleagues, to tweak and adapt and iterate is a really important thing. And lastly, if this is sounding overwhelming to you, which it very well may, the good news is that you need not do this alone, that there actually is. We can say this in 2017, whereas maybe we couldn't have said the same thing 20 years ago. There are support, there's support out there, whether it's your PIOs, of course, at your own universities, but also these broader science communication training organizations that are out there that are providing assistance for this. So there is information and there are resources to help scientists kind of attend to these particular issues as they try to strengthen their public engagement prowess. Well, I think it's important to have metrics, and we encountered one metric yesterday. We met with Francis Collins, and he received from us, from FASF, an award for public service. And that was based not just on his job at NIH, but the fact that he did outreach, that he outreached to the public and to Congress. And I said, we have metrics. Bono mentioned him in a song on a U2 concert a couple evenings ago, shouted out his name. So if that's not connecting to the public, I don't know what is. That's making a big transition. And as far as Congress, two times $2 billion increase for NIH. So there are some metrics. But I agree, we need to have more metrics that we can use. And what I'd like to do is we have about five minutes left. And so I'd like to take any comments that you all would like to make between each other of points that have been brought up. Can I, I'd like to ask Anthony a question. I don't know if he has the answer, fingers crossed. So I was at a presentation by Liz Neely from the Story Collider recently, and she was talking about the research about what makes an audience engage with the speaker, what makes them find the speaker trustworthy. I remember expertise being one of the things. I can't remember what the other ones were. I'm hoping you too have seen this presentation or are familiar with the literature. Like what are the characteristics of a speaker or personality that make that person resonate with an audience? So I can't speak to that exact presentation, but I think I can perhaps build on that. Again, relative to some of the survey work that we were doing. So some of the things that we were really interested in is the extent to which honesty is present, warmth, showing respect for the audience that you're engaging with. 
um, conveying confidence and expertise, um, emphasizing the fact that um, you have lots of things in common, that you have uh, you know, shared values, that you have, in some cases, similar identities. There may be things that are different, right? But there also are always things that are, that are, um, that are similar that can, be, that can be stressed as well. Um, so those are some of the other things that we were interested in, but I'd be curious to see what other stuff that Liz highlighted in her talk. I, th I think it, it's entirely consistent with what you were, with what you were saying. We have other thoughts? So let me just ask in the last couple of minutes, see if you have any perspectives on um, how we reach audiences that are not going to be reading the New York Times and Nature and Science. Because that's the, uh, as some people had called them, the elites. How do, how do we get to uh, those areas that are less research intensive? Somebody said, you know, I could write my congressman, but I'm in Boston. So they're already on board. How do we... How do we communicate with those people? What are, what are the techniques or, or the approaches that journalists or, uh, can use to get, get out into those areas in the old hometown? I think part of the problem is that there's too much attention paid to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and so on. Right? So uh, institutionally, for example, what I'm trying to do when I'm promoting research is not just to like make NC State feel good about itself, right? They don't need the ego boost. Uh, what I'm trying to do is raise awareness of the work with audiences that are relevant, right? So those might be local communities, might be, uh, you know, so for example, if it's about toxicological research in the Cape Fear River, which is relevant uh, in the news down there that recently, um, or if I'm trying to reach you know, discipline-specific news outlets or industry-specific news outlets. I'm trying to reach audiences that will actually, you know, have a pre-inclination to care about this in the first place. Okay? So that's one reason I think that, you know, you shouldn't put all of your eggs in the New York Times basket or whatever. The other reason is that um, not all research, first of all, is done in San Jose or Boston or New York, right? There's really good work being done at the University of Nebraska, which, by the way, is in the middle of freaking nowhere, right? Um, and the same for Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. And I will say that because I'm from the East Coast, and they will roll their eyes and be like, who wants to be there? You have hurricanes. I could go on all day in that regard. But the, the point is, not every university is in a metropolis, right? But they are in large, important cities for their region. If scientists there choose to become engaged, they're going to have a much easier time connecting with um, reporters and news outlets in those parts of the country, and those parts of the country matter, right? Um, and the reason that they're going to be able to do that is because they're, they're, that's where they live. That's where they're raising their children. That's where they go hunting with whoever it is, or when they, you know, they go on vacations to the lake together, whatever. Um, you, you need to try to connect with across communities, but you really need to begin by connecting with the communities that you were already a part of outside of the science community, right? So if you're Catholic, then, you know, maybe do something at your parish, uh, whatever. Whatever your communities are beyond your work identity, tap into those. And this, you know, not incidentally, is one of the uh, reasons why it's so important to have a diverse scientific workforce, which we don't have, and that makes it a heck of a lot harder for us to reach some of those communities, right? So um, go, try to find the places where you already live and have a presence. Uh, I think I can't overstate that. Okay, thanks. Um, we're going to have to conclude here in a minute, but do uh, you have one more comment? Um, yeah, one quick comment is we're talking about the, you know, getting information out to these audiences that typically don't connect with um, science um, as readily, and we're talking about um, what I'd call, you know, informational attempts via traditional sources like journalism. There's a whole other world of media out there, um, one which we often grudgingly um, kind of recognize relative to science outreach, and that's entertainment media. Um, the fact is that many young people, and frankly older people, 
the, their touch points with science come from entertainment media and has nothing to do with journalism. Um, and that's why you see initiatives like NAS's Science and Entertainment Exchange, which is trying to associate scientists more readily with the folks, the producers and directors that are creating that type of entertainment content, knowing full well that, um, you know, that again, that is the touch point for lots of younger people um, relative to science. In fact, at Experimental Biology this year, was, which was held at McCormick Place, there were 13,000 scientists, but because it's such a large convention area, there were 80,000 people who were there for the Chicago equivalent of Comic-Con. And so there were all of these Comic-Con people walking around. I spoke to a few of them, and they said, we love science. We absolutely love science. That's how we get our characters. That's how we know what to do. That's how we think about things. So we're on your team. And I think about the, the, the uh, untapped resources out there, of those kinds of possibilities, and the fact that you say entertainment, maybe we ought to have more comic books. Um, I think we have run out of time at this point for, the, for this session, so I'll thank uh, all the panelists. And uh, we'll take a break here for a while and be back soon.